The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Sunday, February 21st, 2016. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a pre-recorded eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time. This program is designed to interact with you with your questions and comments related to the Bible, and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And so, with our Bibles at the ready, it's now time to turn things over to our speaker for this pre-recorded Questions and Answers Time, and say hello to Chris McCann. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to eBible Fellowship Sunday Afternoon Question and Answer Program. During this time, we're going to open up the room to take your questions, and each person is invited to share what's ever on your mind. Uh, you can contact us, one of the ways that were just mentioned, and we'll be glad to take your call, and I'll try to respond as much as possible by turning to the Bible as the Bible is God's holy word, and it is there that we find our answers. Well, at this time, we're, we're just going to begin by going to the first person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Good morning, Chris. Good afternoon, and to all the listeners, God bless you all. God be with you all. It was a wonderful study, as always. Now, I looked up Melzar, and I know there was not a real definition, but when it's broken up, there is. The latter part, the start, uh, the root, the strong concordance word for it is H6887, so 6887, and it's used as enemy, distress, bind, vex, but um, that word, if you can read some of the verses that I found it in, um, for example, it's in the book of Esther. Um, actually, we can go, yeah, we can go to the book of Esther and where God always talks about Jews, the uh, Haman, the enemy of the Jews, that word enemy is that same word sar, like Mel Sar. Uh, but a good verse, it would be Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 27. Uh, and that word vex is that same word sar, the Mel Sar. Okay. I looked up a lot of words in Charles Concordance. That's why I was able to remember and to recall it from another translation. This woman uh, travailing in her pangs, that word pangs is also the, the soar. That's how many So, um, Nehemiah 9, verse 27, uh, the word vex. And like I said all the time that God refers to the enemies of the Jews, that word enemy is the last soar also. You said ne Nehemiah 9? Is that yeah, right? Yeah, 27. Basically, yeah, uh, the word 927. It's like what you were saying. These people, the, the eunuchs, were encompassed and encircled by their enemies. Even though God, you know, um, protects them, nevertheless, they're still the enemy of the Jews, these people. Mm -hmm. um, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 27. Therefore thou deliverest them into the hand of their enemies who vex them. Um, that word is, I, I, I'm just trying to check out uh, the name Melzar. Sure. I I did look it up, but um, when you look uh, it up, yeah, it just gives you by itself. So I clicked on Melzar. It's four four five three. Then four four five three is broken down a little bit more because um, I knew that last part. The P S A W R is also it's not a it's, it's a Hebrew word. It's, I know sometimes this strong says per Persian derivation, but T S A W R from Mel Sauer, it's the Hebrew, it's the Hebrew word. It's, it's a word we use too, Zua. T S A W R is when you put it in the strong support is that I told you I forgot what it is now. Well okay. Well I thank believe. you for sharing. Uh, I'll try to check that out further. Um, in the the concordance under the word, it says that it's a Persian word, and, and uh, it, it really offered nothing. But uh, I'll, I'll try to check that out. Thank you. Was there, was there anything no else problem. that you wanted to point out? Um, no, just thank you for your teachings. Well, thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to our next caller. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. 
Well, good afternoon, Chris. Um, you mentioned a verse in Proverbs, um, when a man waits, please the Lord, to make it Ethan's enemies to be at peace with him. You could quote it correctly. That's Proverbs um, 16, 7. That's not my question. I just, that's for anybody that wanted to check it out. It's Proverbs 16, 7. Um, my, my question is coming from the book of Luke today, Luke 16, um, verse 14 and 15. But okay. before you read that, before you read that, um, also in 16, that, that same chapter, when it talks about Lazarus, it's only um, verses 2, well, I'm sorry, verse 20 and 21, um, it introduces the, the Lazarus. And I thought about Lazarus when you was talking about how God gives favor and he protects us, he gives us all the heat that we have and uh, all our doings were ordained. Um, what, we, what we're doing now, God knows what we do, but there's been a thing, even our condition and our position. So even in last, when we read Lazarus, we look at oh, how, how a sad story that is. It's really a, a, a blessing to really be a Lazarus because in the, in the end, when God opens the curtains, Lazarus was a saved one, and this rich man wasn't. So it's not that um, it was, there's, there's a verse in um, Luke, uh, take heed, beware of covetousness for one's man. One is Luke 12, so I can't call it right now, but you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, Luke, the way I've covered the for one's man's life, like it's just a bunch of things you can have. I'm sorry, I can't call it right. But anyway, so I was just thinking about that when you say God gives favor, He gave favor to Daniel, and He gives favor to His elect men, but Lazarus also had favor to it because He was a saved right. um, person. Right, you know, yes. He was a beggar. Okay. Yes, ultimately, ultimately, favor is salvation, and and favor right. is uh, when God grants grace and mercy, and He saves someone. Uh, but but also, uh, we we know that God helps His people in various ways, and He helps us. The fact that we're in enduring or continuing and functioning in a world that is so opposed to God himself and to his word and yet the believers are uh, operating and and making it through and and uh, to whatever degree it uh, just just continuing in that way there's uh, indications of God's help and blessing in various ways but ultimately Favor is salvation. Now, you wanted to look at Luke 16, verses right. 14 and um, 15. Is, is yes. that right? Could you explain that, please? Okay, yes. let's take Could a look. In, in Luke 16, and beginning in verse 14, it says, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And so, um, yeah, there, there is, and I, I see why you're bringing up Lazarus, it, it is uh, uh, necessary in... Uh, in our day, as well as at any time, to have uh, a word of caution when looking towards the favor of God and, and seeing how God does favor his people, that, that there is an element in the church today that it's a prosperity gospel and, and God will bless you and, and God will uh, give you riches and and they could refer to various people in the bible that that god did bless like abraham and and isaac and jacob and so forth physically with physical riches and and yet those are people who are uh using the gospel for their covetousness it it's an idolatrous type of gospel when uh, people are looking to God and looking to Scripture in order to find 
uh, profit in the world and, and to prosper physically in the world. And so God points out that those things that are highly esteemed among men are abomination in the sight of God. God is not interested in the physical riches for his people. He does give his people spiritual riches. Now, while they live in the world, some may have physical riches. Others may have nothing of, of the world, of the world's riches, like the example of Lazarus. That that does not determine whether we're blessed or favored of God. The actual determination is salvation. Have we become born again and, and received eternal life and therefore been granted uh, the rich, bountiful blessings of, that God will, will pour out upon, uh, upon those that he has saved forevermore. That, that is ultimately the blessing that God has in view. But thank you for calling and sharing. And we have a question from Pal Talk. Uh, the question is, in Haggai 2.13, in other parts of the Bible... The Lord always stresses how not to touch dead bodies. Why are they so terrible to touch in God's view? Haggai 2, verse 13 says, Then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Well, God just... Uh, established a law. It was uh, in uh, the law of Moses that if someone touched a dead body, they would be unclean for a certain period of time. And, and, and then they would um, do what was necessary to become ceremonially clean once again. There are many laws of God that really establish the same thing. If someone had a running issue, like if you're, you had a runny nose, you would be ceremonially unclean. And there were many, many laws of God where God indicates that uh, if someone um, was in a certain physical condition, they would be unclean. And one of the laws was if you touch a dead body. And all of the law, all of the law where, where God um, pointed out cleanliness and, and uncleanness had to do with teaching and instructing the people of perfect holiness, perfect purity. In various situations, people were said to be unclean, and that taught or instructed the people concerning sin. And uh, so that would be the basic teaching that, that would underlie these ceremonial laws concerning whether someone were clean or unclean. But thank you for submitting your question on Pal Talk. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Yes, Chris. Uh, very good studies. Uh, we're on course. Rejoicing in the fires, yeah, it's a trying time, isn't it? But yet, our hope is that uh, Christ has saved us, and and we're to rely on Him and go to Him. It says, I think, in Second Corinthians, uh, chapter ten, to take all of our thoughts captive to Christ. Uh, also, in Acts seventeen, as the gentleman before was talking about, uh, similar things is that we live, move, and have our being in in Christ and he gives us life, breath and all things. So wow, we got the hope of heaven and righteousness and joy and fellowship forever. So um and um uh, could you go to Psalm forty five ten please? Psalm forty five verse ten says, Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear, forget also thine own people and thy father's house. So uh, we could say that's uh, talking about forgetting the church and, of course, 
your family in the sense of uh, spiritually, though you, you love them still, the physical family and, and the people, even your enemies you love uh, in, in that way. Uh, but is that talking about forsaking the house of God in that particular incident and coming out in the wilderness into Babylon and now we're worshiping uh, Christ, uh, God, Jehovah, outside of the church? Well, no, no, um, not necessarily. Um, uh, here, remember, uh, God, when he saves someone, he draws that person out of the world. And and they're a part of their family, and their family is immersed in the world. And, and so they come out from their own people and out from their father's house. I think Ruth the Moabitess would would be a good example of that. Ruth was told to return in chapter 1 by her mother-in-law Naomi. In Ruth 1 verse 12, Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of Jehovah has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. Jehovah do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, And she left speaking unto her. And I think that's the idea that when God saves someone, that person comes out of the family of the world or out of the kingdom of darkness and is translated into the family of Christ, into the kingdom of God's dear son. And and so we forget our own people, uh, like Ruth forgot the Moabites, and and she also forgot her father's house, and and uh, the way that she was brought up, and the things she learned concerning her gods, and, and so forth. But now we have um, a new kingdom, and a new people, a new God, and, and so we're learning of the things of God, the things of the Bible, and and that means we forget the things that we we previously learned. But thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Yes, Chris. Second Peter three twelve and thirteen. Looking for that coming day of God, where the heavens will be dissolved and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Regardless that the world says we are no longer to seek information from the Bible about the end of the world, the Bible seems to be telling us that we are. Well, you're, you're correct. And, and God is emphasizing it here in a passage that is describing the end of the world. Verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? You know, it's often said by people, well, 
why do you just focus on the end of the world or or why do you keep looking for the end of the world but notice there's much more to it than simply the end of the world god here associates holy conversation that would be holy behavior and godliness with someone who then in verse 12 is looking for and hasting on to the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Just in case anybody would get the wrong idea, God again speaks of the destruction of the world. Yes, people of God, look for and haste. That is, it's looking with... um a sense of urgency, looking with uh, expectation for the world to end, and not only for the world to end. It doesn't end. It doesn't end there. But verse thirteen says, "Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness." Now that's twice God said that believers look for, first of all, the destruction of the world, and secondly, the creation of a new heaven and new earth. And how do we look for it? Can, can someone said to be looking for these things if they never spend any time thinking about it, if they are really not involved in studying the scriptures, the passages, and the Bible is just full of information throughout concerning the end of the world and a new heaven and new earth, and they don't dig into it. They, they don't investigate it. They're not actively looking at the biblical calendar. They're not actively looking at the information concerning the Great Tribulation and the information of Judgment Day. They're, they're not trying to harmonize and, and have all the various scriptures fit together. That, that's, that's really where the children of God are looking, because it's a great mystery God has laid out in his word concerning the end of the world. We have various statements that do not seem on the surface to match or to agree or to fit together. And God did that intentionally because he knows when he writes mysteriously, when he um, gives the pieces of a puzzle and he spreads them out, uh, you know, just like a father who comes home with um, a, a puzzle for his children and, and the puzzle is in pieces it's not put together no that's the fun that's the joy for the children to put it together and so god has given us his word the bible and all the pieces are spread all over the place and it's the um, what does it say the glory of god to conceal a word well i better check it out i i, I get this one mixed up in Proverbs 24, verse 2, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, and that uh, word thing is debar, it, it should be translated word, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter, and that's the same Hebrew word debar. The honor of kings is to search out a word. God hides it, the kings, true believers, find it, and, and search it out, and search the scriptures, uh, for in them you think you have eternal life, and, and uh, uh, compare spiritual with spiritual. Here a little, there a little. Piece of the puzzle over there, piece of the puzzle over here. It is our joy, it is uh, our pleasure to begin putting together pieces. And it's pieces of the puzzle concerning a parable of Jesus that uh, is spiritual. Uh, addressing some some other doctrine or it's pieces of a puzzle concerning a parable of Jesus with 
ten virgins, or sheep and the goats, or um, in, the, this other information. And we have all these statements scattered all over the Bible. And what is a child of God to do? Leave them scattered? Leave them uh, disorganized and out of place? And, and it's why it's what the church has done. The church has developed its eschatology, which is doctrine of end things. And one church says they're a mill. And another church says they're post-mill, or post-millennium. And a third church says they're pre-millennium. And they all have certain doctrines that, that seem to fit their eschatology. And, and yet they, not one of them have bothered or taken the time to harmonize all the other statements that do not fit their eschatology. And... And so it's sort of like live and let live. We'll just stick with our eschatology, even though we can't fit or harmonize all kinds of things with this particular one, and, and we'll let them be a mill, and we'll, we'll keep our post mill. And uh, no, true believers do not do that. We're not content or satisfied when things are disharmonious, when, when they're out of place when there's still pieces of the puzzle laying around. And that's why we keep looking. We keep searching, and much of the puzzle has come together. God has granted us understanding as he opened up the scriptures at the time of the end, during that 23-year Great Tribulation that concluded on May 21, 2011. God gave us much information to fill in this enormous, um, it's sort of the biggest puzzle ever, this enormous puzzle with, with so many pieces, we have it practically all filled in. All we're lacking is just a couple of final pieces, and, and then it will be completed. And that's related to the actual destruction of the earth. We have the timeline of history, the timeline for the church age, the timeline for the Great Tribulation, the beginning of Judgment Day, just a couple more pieces. The problem that some people have is they get frustrated. And, you know, th this is uh, actually me when it comes to actual physical puzzle. Uh, you know, the, the bigger the puzzle, the smaller they make the pieces, and the harder they are to differentiate from one piece to another piece. And it's not very long after working on a puzzle, that this is one you buy at uh, the store, uh, that I'll get frustrated and stop. And, and <laughs> um, you know, sometimes you just wipe your hand over the whole board and, and you, you destroy whatever little bit you manage to put together. And, and that's what people do with the information they learn from the Bible, and yet because they lack a couple of pieces, they got frustrated, and they said, well, I'm not playing anymore, and, and they wiped the board clean. Well, let's go back to the church. Let's go back to former doctrines, and let's start over. And, and no, no, that, that's not how it is. We continue looking and hasting unto the coming day of God, and it would be very foolish, extremely foolish, to, to just dismiss all the things that have fit together very nicely like pieces of a puzzle. They fit. They, they demonstrated they fit. So keep them in place, and let, let's keep looking. Let's see if we can find these last few remaining pieces. Now, unlike, um, you know, here's where the analogy fails with a uh, actual puzzle you buy at the store. That when you only have a few pieces left, it gets very easy. And they have to go here, there, or there. But it's not the case with the Bible. God has, it appears, reserved the more difficult pieces to put into place for the last and 
And, and so we have to wait on him and we have to just keep studying, keep studying and looking. It, it is a command of God. It's not an option. We keep looking for harmonization of the word of God. It's what believers always do. But thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Mr. McKinn, I was doing a study on the word moment and the word hour, and uh, I can't I can't seem, it always seems to be the context. Could you help me understand better God's use of the word moment and hour? If you, if you need any verses, I have them, but it, it's... Well, let, let's, take, um, let's take a couple of verses that, that came to mind, my mind. In Isaiah 26, in Isaiah 26, and in uh, verse 20, it says, Come, my people... Enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, Jehovah cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. Here the Lord is speaking of the day of punishment. That's clear, because God says he's coming to punish the inhabitants of the earth, and he uh, is speaking to believers, and he says, hide yourselves for a little moment. Now, to be hidden in the Bible means that you have become saved. As it says in Colossians, um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 3, for you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And and that's referring to salvation. When we are dead in Christ, our life is hid with God. And and that's uh, what God meant here by hide yourself for a little moment, because the only protection or safe place to hide is in Christ through salvation for the little moment, and we can understand why God is saying this when we we factor in all the other things the Bible says uh, regarding the the day of judgment and the true believers remaining on the earth uh, while God pours out his wrath. So God will put fire to every inhabitant of the earth. Isaiah 24, verse 6 says, The inhabitants of the earth are burned... But as God puts the fire to every inhabitant of the earth, few men are left. The few are the chosen, the elect, who endure the fire. They're the third part that come through, and and they uh, endure to the end and are saved. And, and so the moment here, a little moment, is a reference to the entirety of Judgment Day. So God refers to Judgment Day, but here it's also called a little moment. And I think he does this just to emphasize that it won't be long. Even though we have uh, some other verses, like in Ecclesiastes, that, that would relate Judgment Day to a period of years, yet uh, overall... A period of years in the scheme of things is not very long. It it is like a moment or or, um, a little moment. It's before you know it, it's uh, it's overpassed and comes uh, the end and eternity future. And, And so that's why God refers to the whole of Judgment Day as a moment. Now an hour, an hour can be used for the Great Tribulation period, and and it is often used to identify with the whole Great Tribulation. But an hour is also used when, when Jesus was experiencing the wrath of God the second time in the tableau, and um, he went away to pray, 
and and the statement is made that uh, the disciples could not watch with him one hour or an hour. And so an hour can refer to judgment, just judgment, and, and it does um, depend on what judgment is in view. And, and so there's the hour where judgment began at the house of God. So the hour is an hour of judgment on the house of God. And then God speaks of silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And that would tie in with the 2300 evening mornings. But the whole hour, the, the 11th to the 12th hour in, in the parable that Christ gave, where there was a, a change made in, in the program concerning um, having people come and work in the field uh, because they worked only one hour that last hour, that's the hour of great tribulation, and, and that's the hour that Revelation 18 makes reference to, where it says in verse 9, "...in the kings of the earth." who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. And that's referring to Babylon. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And, and um, I, I don't have the... Greek before me, but I remember looking at this in the Revelation study, um, the nightly Revelation or weekly Revelation study we were doing, and the tense of come is not correct. Actually, is in one hour is thy judgment, thy judgment has come or came, thy judgment came. It, it's past tense because Revelation 18 is looking at the end of of that hour of judgment so the the 11th to the 12th hour has passed or the great tribulation has concluded then babylon falls as we read in revelation 18 but but in one hour thy judgment came the the judgment of god upon the church and with regard to moment if you've got a minute to look at second corinthians 4 16 and 17 could that be looking back the same as you just told me about revelation 18 with regard to our well uh, here I'm not completely sure it it's the equivalent word of the hebrew uh, it it says oh. in second corinthians 4 in verse 16 for which cause we faint not but though our outward man perish Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So, we, yes, we can apply this. It, it fits with, with uh, the idea of Judgment Day being... Uh, a little moment, but it also fits with with the whole of our lives. It, this, I think, has application to the people of God at any time uh, in history, uh, even in the days before the flood when men lived to be 900 years old. Well, uh, in in reality, in comparison to eternity, it's just a moment. It's just the moment that that we have a light affliction and and it soon gives way to the eternal weight of glory. Seventy or eighty years is nothing in comparison to an eternity to come. And and so God highlights that here that um we we should keep in mind that, you know, let, let's say right now um, that if it happens that we're going to have to wait for the Lord for several more years, ultimately that is nothing. It is nothing. 
And when it's all completed, when it's all done, then there will be this eternal uh, new heaven and new earth and eternal life. And, and you go on and on and on. And, and you look back, if it were possible, which it's not because we do not remember the former things. But if you could look back, what would we see? Uh, you know, the, the sorrow of our present time uh, remember what Christ said, that a woman has sorrow when she's in travail, but when a man's born into the world, she she forgets uh, all the sorrow for joy. And, and so, too, when we experience the joy of entering into the new heaven and new earth, and actually we're, we're complete, we're made whole in body and soul, and, and God has destroyed the world, and we're, we're now looking into the glorious eternal future. Well, uh, almost, uh, you, you know, um, if, if we look back after uh, 10,000 years, like Amazing Grace says, but, but there is no 10,000 years, there's no keeping track of time. So it's after eons and eons and eons, if you look back, if it were possible, would you and I remember the tears? Would we remember the sorrow? Would we remember the grief? Would it still be uh, a cause of uh, of pain to us or hurt or affliction in any way if we were at that point that God promises will come? As it says in Titus, uh, um, let me read that because... It's always good to be reminded of this in Titus 1 verse 2 in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began eternal life God promised and he cannot lie so there will there will absolutely will come a point in eternity future where we are making forward progress and this world is all gone and, and all of its misery and all of its sorrows, it's long been destroyed and, and we are rejoicing with God. No more tears or sorrow or pain or death, none of that anymore. And, 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 and so that, that's what God is pointing out. There's no comparison. There's no comparison. And yet, it's only because we're presently alive and because we, we tend to give much more weight to our present circumstances, our, our present sadness and our, our present trials and tribulations and griefs. We, we focus on them. We do not focus on things above as we should. We do not look to the glorious, wonderful promises of God that await us, but instead to our own uh, hurt, we, we concentrate on these little things, these little troubles that now afflict us, and, and so we blow them out of proportion and and we think, well, we, oh, oh, it, it's just so awful and so terrible and so miserable to, uh, to live in this sin-cursed earth. And it is, it is. But when we look at it correctly, when we, we look at it in the proper way, we then say, but so what? So what? All right, I have to live a few more days, perhaps, and I have to continue on. All right, well, let me glorify God while I live. Uh, may I glorify the Lord in the fires and bring him glory during this short, little, tiny period of time that I have left, and, and then I will by God's wonderful grace, experience that new heaven and new earth.
But thank you for calling and sharing. Thank you. And um, we're going to go to our next caller and welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, thank you. Okay, can we turn to uh, Isaiah chapter 51 and read verse 11, please? Isaiah 51, verse 11 says, Therefore the redeemed of Jehovah shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Um, I am confused as to what God is teaching here when it says, Therefore the redeemed of Jehovah shall return. What does that mean when it says, Therefore the redeemed of Jehovah shall return? And what does it mean, and what does Zion represent? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, let, let's take a look at this verse. And this goes along with what we were just talking about. The redeemed of Jehovah shall return and come with singing unto Zion. Now, um, now Zion is another name for Jerusalem. And in the Bible, there's Jerusalem above and there's Jerusalem that is now, or earthly Jerusalem. And Jerusalem can either represent the heavenly Jerusalem, which is made up of everyone God has saved, or the earthly Jerusalem, which is um, a picture of the corporate church. And, and so at the time of the end, God drives out by uh, bringing to pass the end of the church age and, and by um, setting in motion the command to, uh, to flee to the mountains, to come out of the church. Uh, God drives his people out of Zion. They're, they're driven out of Jerusalem. But through salvation... The redeemed of Jehovah return and come with singing unto Zion. So, uh, in other words, even though the true believers have left Jerusalem below, or earthly Jerusalem, they still will return to the heavenly Jerusalem uh, because they have truly been saved and and so with that salvation, there is everlasting joy upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and, sor and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. And that language matches Revelation 21 that I uh, referred to a minute ago, but I didn't read. So let me read it now. In Revelation 21, it says in verse 2, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And that city it is actually the whole company of the elect. Everyone that God has saved is a part of the bride of Christ. And then it says in verse 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And, and again, that matches... Um, the verse that you brought up and, and the language that's in that verse uh, that, that sorrow and mourning shall flee away. The sorrow and mourning flee away because the, uh, the first heaven and the first earth passed away. And with them went, went death, went all the curse upon sin, all the, the bad, all the negative things that have been a part of this creation since the fall are removed. They're gone. And, and, and now, it, it, incredibly, we, at that point, enter into this 
beautiful new life, this new creation where everything is set right, everything operates perfectly and all in accord with the will of God, all those that are brought into that new heaven and new earth are obedient to God, and and life is as it should be, creatures serving their creator forevermore. And and that's what awaits the, the child of God. And as we're fast approaching that day, uh, coming to fruition to to the completion of all things for this world and and God uh, then beginning that uh, eternity future all right well we're going to the next person on the phone welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer <laughs> program please go ahead with your call good afternoon Chris um, Chris um, in regards to the language that we were looking at uh, prior to May 21st, um, the dead bodies, um, uh, I guess we were assuming after May 21st during the five-month period where we thought there was going to be, um, you know, physical uh, punishment on the earth and the, and the language of the dead bodies will be cast upon the earth and uh, will not be buried and, you know, we were assuming dead bodies would be all over. Um and then there is that language in Jeremiah, um, three three verses. Jeremiah chapter nine, verse twenty-two. Jeremiah um, chapter sixteen, verse four, and Jeremiah uh, twenty-five, verse thirty-three, of the dung upon the earth, um, referring to the dead bodies, and and. Uh, and it's, you know, the language you will not lament and suffer and they will be cast upon the earth. Um, spiritually speaking, what period are, is that, is what, is that happening now still or, or, um, or what period of time was that? And I have another question after that. Well, yeah, we, let me read, um, one of the verses you refer to in Jeremiah 9, 22, speak. Thus saith Jehovah, even the carcasses of men shall fall as dung upon the open field, and as the handful after the harvestmen, and none shall gather them. But also, if we go back to Jeremiah uh, chapter 8, where God speaks of bringing out the bones of, and I'm not going to read it, it, it goes on for a little bit, but beginning in verse 1 the bones of the princes and the priests and the prophets and so forth. And then he says he'll spread them out. And at the end of um, verse 2, they shall not be gathered nor be buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. And Mr. Camping, prior to May 21, spent a, a lot of time going into... Um, and discussing the idea of how shameful it would be if um, in the Day of Judgment on May 21, that would be the resurrection. And, and also, uh, it would bring up the bodies of the unsaved, and they would remain scattered or littered across the face of the earth for the five months period. And then at the end of that literal five months, um, it was taught that God would destroy the world on October 21. Well, what about the dead? What about the dead bodies? We did not have the day of resurrection on May 21, 2011. So no bodies came up from the ground, either saved or unsaved, to resurrection or to damnation. So, so that part was wrong. It was incorrect. Yet, what's interesting is that on that day when God shut the door to heaven, he sealed the fate of every unsaved individual. And, and every unsaved individual in the world effectively was killed once the door shut, once the door of heaven shut, and, and God completed his salvation program 
and would never save anyone again. And what resulted from that was there was a world full of billions of people that were killed, again, for all intents and purposes, by God's action. They, they, were, they were destroyed. They were killed. It's only a matter of time before uh, it's finalized. But the, the main thing was God sealed their fate. As it says in Revelation, the righteous from that point on, would remain righteous still, and the filthy, filthy still. Never again would there be translation from unsaved to saved. And and therefore, spiritually, we have a world full of dead people. We have a world of uh, dead people that are moving around, operating in business and in all other areas of physical life, yet God has killed them. He, he has given them a lethal blow by the shutting of the door of heaven. And, and some of this language applies and fits uh, to that idea that, that there is a world full of those that have been spiritually killed. And this is kind of just a little speculation, but I, I do wonder now... Um, my other question, uh, actually, is just a little observation that on that day, when it, whenever it happens of the, uh, our, you know, our going home, um, the rapture, will there be a, a literal earthquake? But the reason why I say that, because um, you look at the accounts like uh, when, when the, um, the angel came to remove the rock, you know, this, uh, the big uh, stone in front of the tomb, there was an earthquake. When Jesus uh, gave up the ghost, there was an earthquake. And in Matthew, uh, that account on the cross, it says that, um, and when these things happened, the centurion and they who were with him saw the earthquake and these things that happened. And then also, um, I think there was one other time, uh, you know, there was an a, a earthquake. So I, re- I wonder, I know we were looking at that prior to May 21st, and then, you know, obviously... It was a spiritual judgment, and it wasn't the rapture. But I wonder whenever the rapture does happen, and we know it's going to happen, is there going to be a literal earthquake? Well, it, it, it may be. It may be. We know that uh, God tells us concerning the rapture in First Thessalonians 4, in verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And those that are alive and remain are the elect left on the earth to go through the period of judgment. And yet we do not uh, prevent them which are asleep, and the asleep are those that are physically dead, the true believers that have died. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Not very comforting to uh, many, apparently, of professed Christians that would have the child of God not to look into these things. Yet again, God has his reasons for telling us, as we read earlier, looking for and hasting unto the coming day of God, because these words comfort the children of God. The children of God know the world must end first before they can enjoy their inheritance, and and their inheritance is tremendous. It's incredible riches. And, and therefore, to read of the world's end, it, it doesn't end it or conclude with that. There's, there's a, a new beginning at that point of forever being with the Lord in a new heaven and new earth. And that's extremely comforting to the child of God. But, but yes, it, it seems that God's methodology 
for resurrection with the examples we have in the Bible is to use an earthquake. The earthquake opens the ground and out comes the bodies. And uh, I don't see any problem for that concerning what God might do on the very last day, the, the time of the resurrection of the dead, of the just and the unjust, at, it, in order to open the ground, even though we, we know that the Bible also speaks of spiritual earthquakes concerning the judgment um, on the church and, and also concerning some language related to Judgment Day, that we, we would have to understand some of those things spiritually, but there's nothing to prohibit an actual physical earthquake as a, a means to bring up the dead. But thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to the next caller. Welcome to our Sunday question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Chris, can I ask a question? I was the first caller, but I didn't have a question. I just made a comment. Yes, yes, go ahead. Um, are we in the rest right now? I'm trying to compare Zechariah verse 111 with Isaiah verse 14, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 7, and that same word, rest. Isaiah 14, the whole chapter is about takedown of Babylon. Of, which is May 21 to us. And yeah. Zechariah 1, when they speak to um, the angel, they're, when they're asking a question, you know, these 70 years, so these 70 years of the captivity have just completed. So are we in the rest? Thank you. Isaiah 14, verse 7, versus Zechariah 1, 11. Thank you. Okay. All right, let's, let's read Zechariah 1 and verse 11. And they answered the angel of Jehovah that stood among the myrtle trees and said, we have walked to and fro through the earth and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Then the angel Jehovah answered and said, O Jehovah of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which thou hast had indignation these three score and 10 years? And three score and ten years is 70 years. And that 70-year period identifies with the assault of Babylon, uh, beginning actually with the Egyptians against Judah in 609 B.C. until 539 B.C. It helps to know that the, the word these, when, when we read that, um, these 70 years, we, we tend to think, it, it's ongoing. It, it's something that was presently happening. But the the Hebrew word translated here as these can also be translated as those. And it would have been more correct. And, and, and it would help us to understand better, to understand it that way, against which thou has had indignation, those three score and ten years, because that uh, assists us to know that it's past. And by the time this statement's being made, it is past. It, it was a, a former time of indignation that, that has now come and gone. And, and that's where the question comes in, because the 70 years typifies the Great Tribulation. And if the 70 years, the indignation, is past, then that would point to Judgment Day or those days after the Tribulation where we presently find ourselves. We're living on the earth in Judgment Day, also known as those days after that Tribulation. And it is a time when the spiritual battle that is raged all through the history of the world between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan has ceased. There, there is no spiritual battle over the souls of men being carried out at this time, nor has there been since May 21, 2011. Because the battle raged, 
with the sending forth of the gospel into the darkness of the world, into Satan's kingdom, to find the elect. And, and, and Satan resisted and put up a fight and opposed and assaulted the truth of God's word to keep those um, elect individuals in their sins and therefore under his control. And, and so that was the battleground. It was always concerning the spiritual condition of man. But by May 21, 2011, God completed his salvation, saved the last one of the elect, the last one whose name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life, was found, and God then stopped sending forth the gospel. He no longer sends forth the gospel into the world to evangelize, to find souls. And, and therefore, if God's not sending the gospel, Satan has nothing to resist or nothing to fight against. And there is a rest. And more than that, Satan himself has been put down and deposed. And that's where Isaiah 14 comes into it. In Isaiah 14, we're reading of the king of Babylon, who is a figure of Satan. It says in verse 4, well, well actually, to get the context here, um, it says in verse 3, And it shall come to pass in the day that Jehovah shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou was made to serve, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hast the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. Jehovah has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. And this is all referring to Satan. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Uh, again, yes, Satan has been defeated. Christ was victorious. And the Lord Jesus now rules all that Satan previously ruled. Christ is ruling the nations with a rod of iron in the day of judgment. And there is a rest. It's why we and others are not going on track trips with the Does God Love You track. And, and trying to uh, reach out to seek the lost sheep of the house of Israel. No, no, because there are no more lost sheep. There, there are sheep to be fed that have already been found, but there's no more lost sheep. So our activity is not to be engaged in evangelization to, to as it were, uh, reopen a war that is settled. There is rest now. There is quiet in that battle, in that warfare. There, there is uh, no more need for the people of God to be involved. And, and these verses that you're referring to uh, point that out. But thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to our Next caller, I think this will be our last caller this afternoon. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. I want to look at uh, Matthew 24, verse 30. Um, I'd like to know why everybody, especially yourself, always interprets this literally about Christ coming down out of heaven. Now, if he literally is going to come down out of heaven then the whole earth, that means the wicked, will see him come. And what I'm saying is every date setter has been wrong because that event never happened. But if somebody would interpret this spiritually, maybe this has already happened. You know what I'm saying? Well, Matthew, yeah. Um, actually, uh, E-Bible does not interpret this literally. We, we do interpret it spiritually. 
And mm -hmm. as it says in the previous verse, in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation, of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So we, we understand that took place on May 21, 2011. God put out the light of the Gospels. And then verse 30, since we understand verse 29 spiritually, and, and we understand it that way because that's how it must be understood, then in verse 30, and then, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Now, the Lord Jesus made a point to stress that a child of God does not look for outward signs. It, it, it's an evil and adulterous generation that looks for a sign from heaven. But the only sign that the Bible gives is the sign of the prophet Jonah. And that sign must be interpreted by reading the Bible. You, you can't know about the sign of Jonah unless you read the book of Jonah. And, and that means you have to read the Bible. And so, too, to see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, you have to read the Bible. You have to understand the deeper spiritual meaning of what God has done with putting out the, the light of the sun and the moon and the stars. That is, as we understand from the Bible that actually it was the spiritual gospel lights that are put out, and then that darkness, spiritually speaking, that blackness of heaven, is the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. And, and we're not seeing it literally in any way. We're seeing it on the pages of the Bible. Now, there's a verse that proves that this language concerning the Son of Man coming in clouds with power and great glory must be understood spiritually. And it's in Matthew, Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus is before the high priest of Israel. And it says in verse 63, But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now notice that language and how it parallels Matthew twenty four 30. You'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and Jesus said to the high priest, Hereafter, and that means from now, from now, this point, you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And, and well, when we read the rest of the Bible, we don't find any literal time that the high priest or the Jews saw Christ uh, coming in the clouds of heaven, but it was done or accomplished spiritually when the gospel was established, when um, God confirmed that Jesus was the Messiah and and the the church age was confirmed by God and so forth. With each confirmation, it was as though they saw Christ sitting at the right hand of God and coming in the clouds. And, and, and so it, it's a spiritual statement that it has a spiritual meaning and it's the same with matthew 24 verse 30. the clouds though the clouds what are they well the clouds represent the the commandments of god or the bible for instance if you go to numbers chapter 9 numbers 9 um and uh, i would recommend you read the whole chapter but uh, the the israelites follow the movements of the clouds concerning whether uh, they would they would um, take journey or whether they would set the set up their camp and and again and again god refers to the cloud as 
his commandment. It says in Numbers 9, verse 23, at the commandment of Jehovah, they rested in the tents, and at the commandment of Jehovah, they journeyed. They kept the charge of Jehovah at the commandment of Jehovah by the hand of Moses. Well, God gave no actual commandment, no verbal commandment. The commandment was the movement of the cloud. If the cloud stayed still, they were to um, pitch their tents. If the cloud moved, they were to journey. So the commandment of Jehovah is identified with the cloud. And, and uh, that means the Bible, the Bible is the commandment of Jehovah. The Bible is the cloud that, that uh, you see the Son of Man coming in the clouds in the scriptures. You, again, the sign of the prophet Jonah must be understood by reading the Bible. You see the sign of the Son of Man in the clouds by reading the Bible. Uh, Also, we read in Hebrews 12, after God has just written about the, the men of faith or the people of faith in Hebrews 11, he says in Hebrews 12, verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses... And, and that is a good way of describing the Bible. The Bible is a record of witnesses. The gospel accounts are testimony from witnesses. The, the prophets are witnesses to the word that God has declared to them in dreams and visions and so forth. And so all the Bible is a cloud of witnesses. And again, when you see Jesus in the clouds... It, when, when we read it in the Bible and know it, because the Bible has confirmed it, then we're seeing the sign of the Son of Man. And that sign is in place and has been in place since May 21, 2011. But thank you for calling and sharing. And I would like to thank everyone for joining us today, this afternoon. Uh, thank you for your questions and comments, and especially the Bible verses we had an opportunity to read and consider. Uh, we're, we're going to return to our online fellowship in just a minute, but uh, I'd like to invite everyone to join us tonight on Facebook with our Sunday Bible uh, question and answer group that will start tonight at 8 p.m. until 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. It's a text question and answer group that all are welcome, and once you join the group, you can Submit your question at any time, but it is between 8 and 9.30 tonight that there will be responses. But for now, we're, we're going to go back to our online fellowship, and may you have a good afternoon, and may the Lord's perfect will be done. And thank you for joining us again for eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your speaker, Chris McCann. You can join us for these questions and answers sessions Sunday afternoons following the Sunday studies and certain weeknights following the Monday through Friday studies. Check ebiblefellowship.com for the current schedule. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.